And we as a church are going to, um, we're going to take a moment and we're just going to, just going to pray over, over them. I'll tell you guys why when Ryan gets unhooked here, he's un- unclicking from the matrix. So, um, come on over here, Ryan. And then Casey, why don't you, my wife's going to join us over here. So today is the, it's the last Sunday that Ryan will be with us, Correct. Yeah, Ryan is going to spend the next six months, right? Ryan's going to spend the next six months working on a, working on a cruise ship. And um, it's, it's not only is it his last Sunday with us, but it's his last Sunday, you know, leading worship with his, with his wife, Naomi. So if you haven't put two and two together, these two are married. Yeah, and um, I, I just feel like what, what we can do as a church is we can vow to protect this family and as a church, we can vow to protect this marriage. And as a church, we can vow to surround this family and their children and their kids, and we can take care of them. We can pray for Ryan every single day that he's away. We can pray for Naomi and, and her kids every single day that, that Ryan's not there. We're going to pray safety over their house. But I just, for those of you in this church that, that pray, and I know that I'm on a WhatsApp group with you. There's people that pray in this church. These two names are going to be a staple until Ryan is back home. So that's the commitment. Can we make that commitment? Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to say a prayer over them. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, uh, that you designed marriage to work, that you designed marriage um, just to be a beautiful gift that we have. Thank you, Father, for Ryan and Naomi, for everything they've poured into this church. Thank you for Ryan uh, his energy, his light, just the joy that he brings, not only to the band, but to our high school kids. Father, we, we are going to sorely, sorely miss him. But Lord, thank you, Father, that you just brought this amazing family into our church. And Father, as a church, we commit and we vow to stand for their marriage, to stand for their family, to stand for their relationship together. We pray that you put a hedge of protection around them. We pray, Father, that you just guide and protect them. We pray, Lord, that that this is a season where, in your miraculous way, they continue to grow closer and closer together. Father, bring them peace, bring them ease as they spend this time apart. And Lord, just bless them and bless their family. And Father, we as an entire church commit this in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, man. Thank you. I love you guys. Yeah. 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 We love you guys. We love these two. We love these two. We've been made better because of them. Thanks, thanks, Casey. So, um, good morning, everybody. Uh, hope you guys are doing well today. I'm just going to quickly run through some some announcements that we've got going on before I jump into the to the sermon. Um, we here at, at this church, and I know we've got a lot of new people here, so I just want to make sure that you know who we are. And we've got the couple statements that we like to say uh, that are really important to us. And we're a church to call home, a family to call your own. Uh, we want you to feel at home here. We want you to feel like this is a place where you can identify as a family. And, and we're a friendly church that hopes to inspire you to seek Jesus. So that's really our aim here is for you to feel at home here and then to just be a friendly church. So I want to run through a couple announcements. The first announcement that I want to tell you guys about is we've got uh, a women's study that's coming up, and they're going to pop that on the, on the screen here. There we go. There we go. We've got a women connect. We call it women connect. So we've got these amazing ladies that gather together and they plan these women, uh, these women's events. So if you're, if you're female, if you have a womb, you are invited to this. So... That's a horrible way to say that, right? I just realized that. As the words fell out of my mouth, I thought, let me, can I get them back? You can't get them back. It is, it's out there. So this is a four-week study of, of Psalm 90. And, and last year they did a, this, they had an amazing study and it just went so well. So if you're looking for that in your life, it starts the 1st of February, 9.30 a.m. here at South Point Church, and that's, that's four weeks. Uh, there's four weeks of that. And then I've got another important announcement for you. We've got kids stuff coming up. Uh, do I have any parents in here whose kids have been to kids stuff? Yeah, we've got some hands. Uh, we've got lots of hands. It is probably the most magical evening that this building holds. Um, it's for kids that are in Upstreet, 
Uh, so it, even younger kids, but it's really, it's a family environment. And we're kicking the year off with, with a movie night. So at 6 p.m. on Friday the 3rd, we do this the first Friday, just about the first Friday of every month. And uh, this week we're watching Inside Out. So we've got this huge screen that comes down and it fills this whole stage. And we have popcorn and all kinds of stuff. And we're going to play a movie and it's going to be great. So parents, come, bring a blanket, bring your kids. Um, even if you've not seen the movie and you don't have kids, you're welcome to come. Uh, so you're invited to that. So we've, we've got that coming up for us. And then um, I, I'm, I know I'm forgetting one announcement. Jordan, throw on the screen that, that first slide that I forgot. There we go. We've got Precept. So Precept is, uh, a, a, is an in-depth Bible study. And our, our Precept group, they meet on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. here. And they're doing a, a 12-week study. And so if, if there's anything in you that just wants to go deeper in the Bible, that wants to know the Word, that wants to study the Word, this is probably one of the best opportunities that you have to do that. Right, Auntie Sheila? So up here in the front row, we have Auntie Sheila, who actually started Precept here in, in South Africa. And so this is an amazing opportunity. And I'll tell you that the people that I go to first for prayer and for help in this church, guess which group they go to? They, they go to this one. So if you're looking to go deeper, this is absolutely perfect for you. And then last but not least, on your chair, we've got a value card. And on one side of the value card, it gives you all of our giving information. This has been an amazingly giving church. We are just so blessed uh, by you guys and the way that you tithe. And so if you want to tithe to us, you're basically saying that I trust God with my money and I believe in the mission and vision of South Point Church. And then there's all the details that you need to tithe there. So thank you so much. It's because you tithe and you give that life change gets to happen here uh, every single week. And then on the other side of the card, you'll see that there's a place where you can tell us how to pray for you. We've got a prayer team that does take time out of their week to pray for you. And then we've got this in the top right corner. You've got um, a, a thing called Next. And what we believe about Next is this is your next step here in, in the church. And I know a lot of you that have been here for a long time, you know exactly what this is, but hey, we're growing church and we've got a bunch of new people here. And if you're new here and you don't know exactly what is South Point about, what do we do, who are we, Next is the, is the perfect place for you. It's Sunday, the 12th of February, after the service in here. And we just go through kind of how we do what we do and why we do it. And so then we want to equip you with the ability to make a decision of, I like this place or I don't like this place. And so that's that. And then the last thing that I want to tell you about is we've got this thing called Irresistible. So Irresistible is something that we've kind of come up with and we kick off our community groups every year and, and I can every year because this is the second year we've done it and uh, we did it last year but we get all of our community groups together and it's every Thursday night for a month and what we've titled this one is is irresistible because it's going to partner with a sermon series that I'm going to do on what does it mean to serve an irresistible Jesus an irresistible church and an irresistible love and so if, if you are in a community group we would invite you here on th on on Thursday night, it's the first, or it's every Thursday in February, and it's come at 6 for 6.30. And if you're not in a community group, if you don't have any community, or you're new, this is designed for you to come. There are no cliques. We don't, you know, separate all the groups out and say, okay, who doesn't have a group? You guys sit by yourself. Or, no, it's just one big kind of mess where we're all together, and we're doing this together. And I would love to see the entire church come out for this, but I, I, this is going to be so great. It's going to help anyone that said, hey, I'm looking for a friend, I'm looking for community. This is a place for you. And then lastly, I'll put our, our WhatsApp number up here. This is the best way to get in touch with us. And we send out on a broadcast list a, a, a couple messages. We'll kind of give you a link for the sermon if you want to watch that, but we advertise on there. Like We'll let you know the details, because I know everything I've said, everyone here is going to forget, right? Everybody. Everyone's going to forget every single time, detail, and date, unless you're like my wife, then she will probably remember it, but I know that I've already forgotten it. And so this number, if you're part of our broadcast list, we just, we just remind you of what's going on and when it's going on. So hey, that's it for announcements. I'm getting to the message. I'm really excited about today's message. We're finishing um, a three-week series that we've been going on, and it's called A, a Beginner's Guide to Winning at Life. And the reason that I, I picked this series is I wanted to start the year off by giving us an opportunity to really uh, 
to come out in January and feel like we're winners. I feel, I feel like people need a win. And we want to start the year off with a win. We want to start the year off feeling like, like man, I, I, I know that, that this year, you know, last year may have been hard for you. Maybe it wasn't hard for you. But, man, this year I'm going to start with a win. It's going to be amazing. Starting people off with a positive mindset. That, that's kind of been my goal. How do we feel like we're winning at life? So to give you a bit of a recap, on week one, we talked about, so there's three steps to this. Step number one, build a solid foundation. So we talked about the story of not building your house on sand, but building your house on, on, uh, on stone and how that builds a solid foundation. We want to build a solid foundation in our life. If you don't have a solid foundation, everything kind of crumbles from there. Uh, week two, we talked about beginning a spiritual discipline. This was last week. And, and it was like, hey, you need to connect with Jesus. And I actually issued you guys a challenge. I said, if you read your Bible, if you pray, if you talk to Jesus in any way, and you do it seven days this week, and nothing changes in your life, or you don't feel like Jesus has, has connected with you, or Jesus hasn't shown up for you in some way, then, then you can come up after the service. You can say, hey, Chris, you're wrong. Because I believe that Jesus is, his love for us is a guarantee. And I can boldly say that if you reach out for him, he will, he will reach for you. And so that was where beginning a spiritual discipline was. Now, this week, before I get into the third step, I, I want to kind of open with a bit of scripture because I want to take us on a journey. I love taking you guys on journeys. And I want to take us on a journey of kind of unpacking kind of really this whole series. And we're going to do this by looking at a verse in John. And this is in, in John 10.10. 10. And it, it says this. It says, the thief comes... Only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. So this is a great verse. I love this verse. You know, when, when we hear this verse, we often think about the thief. But before we talk about the thief, I want to talk about what, what I have in blue here. So this is Jesus. Jesus is telling us why he came. So when we're talking about how do we feel like we're winning at life, well, let's look at how and why the Creator came. So Jesus is saying that I came so that you may have and enjoy life. Last night I got the opportunity of officiating a wedding, and it was great fun, and I can promise you they were enjoying life. They have and were enjoying a life. But, but Jesus came so that we can walk around every day. And we can enjoy our life. Do you enjoy life? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But what, what do, you, do you mostly enjoy it or do you mostly not enjoy it? Jesus came so you can enjoy life. If you're not enjoying life, then there's something that can be addressed in your life. And then he came so that we can have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. So it's like, man, okay, Jesus has given us a great promise. So I want you to understand, in your seat right now, you, this is real life, this is not preacher, preacher stuff, this is real life. You were designed to receive Jesus and get an abundantly joyful life so that it overflows. And this is regardless of your circumstances or regardless of your situation. That, that was the design for your life. Now I know that many of us don't feel that way, but that was the design. That's the actual design for your life. But now what we have to do is we have to address the other part of this scripture, the thief part. See, who in this verse is the thief? Jordan, put the verse back up for me one more time. The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. That's kind of the opposite of what Jesus came for. Jesus came to give life. The thief comes to take life. Jesus comes to give it in abundance, and the thief comes to destroy it, to take it completely away, to destroy the abundance of it. See, th th this thief, it comes and it takes what Jesus intended for us to have. So the question for you is, is, is who is the thief? You know, we could say, okay, it's, it's Satan. Obviously, Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy we could say that it's, uh, it's fine. I was going to make a mother-in-law joke, but my mother-in-law is here. And, yeah. and she, she, she actually is part of the abundant life. She leaves on Thursday. No, I mean it. I mean it. 
Listen, you guys need to keep the Ladd family in your prayers because when, when, uh, when Casey's mom leaves on Thursday, we are going to be a, an emotional wreck and a mess. She's been amazing to have in. So, so I can't make a mother-in-law joke there. But, <laughs> but, but the, the thief that I want, I want you guys to, to wrap your head around here. Is it, yes, I'm not trying to take away from the fact that it's Satan. I'm not trying to take away from these, these other things that want to kind of steal um, joy. You know, toxic relationships could be another one that steals your joy. You know, it could be a thief in your life. The thief that I want you to look at today is actually you. You are your own thief. You're the thief. It, 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 it's you, and I can say this because sometimes, you know, we are our own worst critics, you know, we're the ones that look at ourselves with the most critical heart, with the most critical attitude. Who believes in you the least? Usually it's yourself. See, see you are the thief in, in this scenario. And one of the greatest things that, that causes us to be our own thief of abundance and of joy and of all those things that Jesus came for so that we could have this great life is is, is the thing that kind of equips us as a thief to steal the most from us are our thoughts. And so I've got this representation here. See, we and our thoughts are some of the most dangerous things that we carry around. See, our thoughts determine, um, you know, our self-worth. They determine how happy we are. They determine... Uh, whether or not we're, we're doing well or not doing well, but, but our thoughts stay with us. You know, they start in the morning when we wake up and our thoughts just carry on with us and they go all the way to the end of the day. And some of us are great with our thoughts and some of us are horrible with our thoughts. You know, so personal story for me, I struggle so much sometimes with my thoughts, you know, believing in myself, not carrying around guilt or not carrying around shame or not carrying around stress or did I do good enough here and what about this relationship, you know? And there, there's a meme, there's a thing on the internet where it's got uh, one picture, it's a picture of a, of a, I think it's a girl or a guy, whoever, but, but they're smiling, they're happy and like life looks wonderful. And then on the next picture, it's got the same person with a thought bubble and it says, hey, remember that one time seven years ago when you said something and, uh, you know, your friends laughed at you and it's like your, your thoughts come, they just they come after you. So sometimes it feels like, you know, and again, I'll just speak from my experience. Sometimes it feels like, you know, I can be running from my thoughts, like that my thoughts can say, oh, look, Chris is happy. He's having a good day. Bam. Here, how about that memory? There goes Chris's good day. You know, and and that happens to us, to all of us. This is the thing that we don't want to admit, that we walk around and we say on Sunday morning, hey, I'm doing great. I feel good. Hey, how are you? Oh, life is great. You know, Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Now, you don't want to be the awkward person that says, well, my life's horrible and here's what happened. But our, our, our thoughts dictate and determine so much of that. See, it's hard to fight a battle that's within yourself. It's much easier to help someone else fight their battle. And so where does this come from? Where, where do these thoughts come from? I want, I want to talk to you a little bit about science talk to you guys a little bit about the way the brain works because this is where the kind of the the hard news is and this is also where the good news is so let, let's take a moment to think about the brain so the, the the brain you know some of us have bigger brains and some of us have smaller brains some of us know how to activate our brains what is it the age of uh i think it, with with guys or kids it's they don't actually their brain isn't fully developed until they're 30 or something or it's you know, it's 18 or 16 or 15, somebody, Gail, is that right? Something like that, you know? You know, yeah, it, 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 let, let's talk about the brain. So in, in your brain, you've got about 10,000 thoughts that pass through your brain a day. That's maybe for a normal person. Someone like me maybe has, you know, has more than that. But you've got like 10,000 thoughts that pass through your brain. Now, inside your brain, your brain is made up of, of these things called neurons, and there's 100 billion neurons that, that make up your brain. So if you don't understand the science of that, that I just, you know, take away from, from all of this is, you know, I want to make it really simple for you, is that you've got these things in your brain, these, these neurons in your brain, and they play a really important role. They play a really significant role. And they actually create what's called these neural pathways. 
And these neural, neural pathways, actually, when they study the brain, these are actual physical grooves that are on the brain. And so if you take somebody, let's talk about depression. Depression uh, is a hard thing that people don't like to talk about. They don't like to admit that they deal with it. But when someone has a major depressive breakdown, they've actually found out through science, through, through scans, that it actually creates a groove in their brain. So you create these neural pathways. A neural pathway is created, and if you think about this, uh, for all of my mountain bikers or all of my, my trail runners, you know, you think about a pathway. A pathway, oftentimes, it, if, if you just walk down it a couple times, it starts out really, really small. It's as wide as your feet. Is, is all this. But when you start coming down it a lot and you bring all your friends with you and everyone, you know, the, 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 the pathway gets wider and it gets wider and it gets wider. And before you know it, you know, it's a, it's, you know, a three meter wide trail. And our neural pathways are the exact same way. The more that you do something, the more you think about something, the more that you have done to you, those grooves in your brain, they get deeper, they get wider. And what happens is that it gets easier for you to slip into that groove. So for any of my friends in there, uh, in the audience that have joined me in, in having these you know, fun major depressive breakdowns, when you have one, it's easier to have two. When you have two, it's easier to have three. When you have one panic attack, it's easier to have another one. When you have one you know, case of anxiety, it's easier to have another one. When you look at pornography for the first time, it's easier to look at it again and again and again and again. And what you're doing is you're physically shaping your brain. These neural pathways become real pathways in your thoughts. Now, th this, is, this is where it's kind of, it's almost dangerous. But it's bad, it, th this is where it's bad for us. Because we do things outside of here. Everything you do impacts yourself. Everything you do impacts your heart, but also everything you do impacts like your brain, the way you think, the words that come out. So you have to be careful about the TV shows I watch and the way I talk, because if, if I do dumb stuff at home, it's going to come out here and you guys are going to hear it. So I have to make sure that I protect everything that comes into my brain. So we, we have to protect that. But a lot of times, we don't protect that. And there are things that, are, that influence our thinking, things that influence us. And it, and it really brings us down to this truth is that our, our behaviors are driven by our beliefs. See, our behavior is being driven by our beliefs. What, what you believe is going to determine your behavior. So when you believe that, that you are someone that is um, not worth it, someone that deserves a lot of guilt and shame, when you believe that, that you are a, a toxic person or you've hurt a relationship that can't be mended, that belief is going to determine your behavior. See, the, these neural pathways, these little trails that run through your brain that have been carved by your behaviors, that have been carved by your beliefs, those things create this lasting impression on you. And then another truth for us to wrap our head around here with this is that our, your life will always represent and follow your strongest thoughts. Your life will always move in the direction of your strongest thoughts. We talked about this a little bit last week. So do you like where your life is going? Because it's going wherever your strongest thoughts are taking it. See... The, the, what comes into here is so important for us. Because Jesus came to give us an enjoyable life in abundance. But the thief aims to destroy, to destroy that. It aims to kill. It aims to take it away. And we are our own biggest thief. And, and we don't even realize it. None, no one's bad. If you carry around bad thoughts, you're not a bad person. You just not realize what's happening. So my goal today is to change the direction of your life by helping you change your strongest thoughts. Because if you can change your strongest thought, then you can aim and point yourself and point your direction anywhere that you want to go. And so this is not all bad. That's the bad stuff. And I want to tell you that there is good news because there is always good news. There's always good news because we serve a good Jesus. 
And the, the, the good news is, is that because our brains are, are moldable and shapeable, see, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible, you know, that says that we can renew our minds, and that's great. And when you wake up, you know, in the morning, you can renew your mind for bad, but you can also renew it for good. And then there's this thing that, that's built into our brain that they discovered in, in 1998. They actually discovered that every morning when you wake up, you have new brain cells. And these new brain cells are just ready to be shaped. It's like you wake up and, you, and your brain says, all right, we got a fresh bank here. We got all these new brain cells. Chris, how are you going to shape us today? What are we going to do? What are we going to think about? Where are you going to spend me? Where are you going to spend these new brain cells? Believing in yourself? Not believing in yourself? Believing the best in someone else? Not believing the best in someone else? How are you going to do this? And because we get these new brain cells every day, there's this term that, that, um, that Dr. Caroline Leaf has, has really kind of made, you know, kind of famous and public for us. And it's things called neuroplasticity. And what this refers to is this refers to the capacity of the nervous system to modify itself functionally and structurally in response to experience and injury. So what this means for us is that it's not just a functional modification, it's structural. So what that means for us is all those little pathways and trails that have carved into your brain because of depression or anxiety or things you've done you know, uh, wrong or things that have been done to you that were wrong, all those, all those pathways can be filled in. All those pathways can be covered up and filled in. And you can actually renew your mind structurally. You can change the physical shape of your brain by changing the way that you think. And functionally, you can function in a happy, you can function happier. You can function in the way that Jesus designed for you to function. See, our mind is so powerful. And, and Dr. Caroline Leaf has a quote for us here that I want to read for you. And she talks about the power of the mind. Jordan, you can put that up here for us. And she says, your body is not in control of your mind. All right, see, we, we like to play the victim card. Well, I can't do it. I'm not strong enough. I'm not, you know. But your body doesn't control your mind. Your mind is in control of your body. And your mind is stronger than your body. Mind certainly is over matter. Now, a lot of the athletes in the room, they understand that because when their body fails, because they've trained their mind for endurance, they can continue to push their body. That's why we see just the most incredible things It is the, these amazing people that have learned to train their mind to overcome what their body feels. And even for us, our mind is stronger than our body. When you physically don't feel like you can do another day, your mind is stronger than your body. And so we're going to look at, I want to introduce scripture now to you. So Paul, this goes all the way back. It's not a new thing. It's newly discovered. But Paul, who we love to talk about, he actually writes about this. And Paul talks about how the mind can be renewed. See, Paul was, he, he wasn't a scientist. He was just a believer in Jesus. And because he was a believer and a follower in Jesus, Jesus just dropped all this amazing just, you know, information. And I would say that the world and science has been taking a long time to catch up to the truth that people like Paul already knew. And so it's amazing when we watch science catch up to it. And it's amazing to celebrate that, that science and that man has realized more and more of the truth and the beauty and the complexity that God put in each and every single one of us as, as humans. And so Paul writes in Romans 10, 10, or, or Romans 12, 1, is where Paul starts to, starts to talk to the congregation, to the church in Romans. And he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. And so the reason he said, therefore, is, is Paul has just had a discussion with the Jews. And he said, hey, Jesus is not just for you as the Jewish people. Jesus is also for the Gentiles. And a Gentile was anybody that was not a Jewish person. And so Paul is saying that Jesus is for everybody in the world. That when Christ died... The curtain, the veil tore, and, and Jesus became accessible for everybody. So Paul's just had this conversation, a little bit of an argument. And so he said, hey, therefore, okay, we've, we've talked about this. And so now, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, what is mercy? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. 
So in view of God's mercy, the fact that God's not giving you what you deserve, he's saying, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, when they heard this verse, when Paul said this, and Paul said, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, I just, I want you to know, it probably freaked a bunch of them out because to them, a sacrifice was when you killed an animal and you put it on the altar and burnt it. And so Paul is saying, you're no longer offering a dead sacrifice. You're offering a living sacrifice. This whole old practice where you would kill an animal or you would make a a sacrifice that ended the life, that shed blood, that is over and done because Jesus made his sacrifice for us. Jesus ended his life, his blood was shed, and when that happened, the dead sacrifices stopped. And Paul is saying, now we offer our bodies a living sacrifice because we are living, we are alive. And Jesus has given us life abundantly. So that's why he says that. He says, this is your true and proper worship. So the way you live, the way you think, the way that you are, that's how you worship God. So now Paul goes on in verse 2, Romans 12, 2, and he starts to give instruction. He says, do not conform to the patterns of this world. So let's let's look at this whole verse. I've broken this verse down. Let's look at it from the viewpoint of our thinking. All right, that's that's where we want to focus on, is the way that we think. So when I say, when Paul says, do not conform to the patterns of the world, what what thought patterns do we not want to conform to? Which way do we want to change our thinking that's different from the way that the world would tell us to think? You know, we could say, okay, I, I, I don't want to conform. I don't want to think about social media, and I don't want to think about, you know, the way that I raise my kids. You know, we, we've got, um, you know, parents that we hear all the time in high school that, that tell us like, oh, you know what, the, the grade nines, the grade eights, you know, they go, they drink, they smoke weed, just, it's fine, they'll get it out of their system, they'll come around in grade 10, grade 11, and Casey and I said, we do not conform to the pattern of Rondavash. It just doesn't work for us. And so I, I would ask you to think in your life, what, what patterns around you do you need to stop conforming to? Where are you getting pressure from the world saying you need to participate in, be a part of this pattern, this worldly pattern? And Paul is saying, don't conform to that. Now, what he's actually addressing in the verse is he's telling the Pharisees, stop conforming to the patterns of the world. Stop it. Stop putting your foot down and saying that Jesus is not for the Gentiles. Stop conforming to what everyone else believes and have your own independent thoughts. See, Paul's challenging them to this. And so then he says, don't conform to the patterns of this world. And he goes on to say, and he says, but be transformed... So now he gives us a verb. He tells us what it is that we can do. So it's not just, hey, stop thinking the way the world thinks, and then that's over and it's done. He says, stop thinking the way the world thinks. Don't conform to that, but you're going to be transformed. Be different. If you're not happy with where you are, then you get to transform. Stop conforming. You know, one of the biggest things that we conform to are our own thoughts. Because our own thoughts tell us that you can't conquer this situation. You'll never beat this addiction. You'll never be a good enough dad or mom. You'll never be good enough. All the other moms pack amazing lunches for their kids in school. And and there's this whole world on Instagram, this bento box world where moms are packing these crazy lunches. There's so much pressure on, on, on you guys as moms to provide for your kids. Stop conforming to all those thoughts. Just love your kids. Be, be transformed. Paul's saying you're going to be transformed. You're going to be made different. Be transformed from what your thoughts say. And then he goes on after this. He says, but, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So this is where we get the opportunity to renew our mind. We get to change those neural pathways. Every morning you wake up, you've got new uh, brain cells in your brain. You get to shape those the way that you want to shape them. And so he says, you're going to renew our mind. And then he goes on in, in the verse here, and he says, by, by the renewing of your mind. There we go. Thank you. And he says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
Now, I've got some words highlighted here for us. Test and approve. See, that what, what Paul is talking about there is well, we don't test for bad, we test for good. And, and what we're going to do as we test is we're going we're gonna to change the way we think. We're going to be conformed. We're going to be transformed. We're no longer going to conform. And then we're going to test that. And we're going to then approve that because his will is good and pleasing and perfect. And so now I want to put this whole verse together for you and just, just read it all for you. Paul says in Romans 12 too, and actually I want to make this personal. I want to make this personal to you. So I'm, Paul is speaking to you, not the church of Rome, but to you. So I want you to activate your brain. Think about your situation. Think about your thoughts. Put your thoughts in your mind right now. Focus on this and listen to what Paul says. Paul tells you, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. See, even after all of that, even after making the case about transform, transforming your mind and renewing your mind and pleasing your mind, I just want to. I just want to say, and I know this is. I know this is true. Is that there's still a bunch of people sitting in your chairs right now that that still don't believe this. You still don't believe that you can change. You still don't believe that there's something different for you. You still don't believe that this applies to you. You still don't believe. And I want you to know that if that's you, that's okay. Maybe this is your first time ever hearing something like this. Your first time in church. And you're like, man, I've got this thing and that's all great and I love what the pastor says and fantastic, but my life, I I don't see that being different for my life. So I know that there's those of you out there that still don't believe. And so I'm speaking to those of you now that struggle to believe because the lies that you believe shape the life that you live. And, And I don't know about you, but I love you guys. I care about you guys. I care about this church. And and the life that you live is being shaped by the lies that you believe. And that bothers me. Because I know that you're all wonderful people. Could you imagine that, that the potential that's in this room or the potential that's in your heart, the potential that's in you, the potential that's in your family and your love and in your mind to be unlocked, to just no longer believe the lies, that's amazing. It's amazing. I, I, I have dealt, been on a, a, such a journey in my life, and the journey may never end. I know what it feels like to be depressed, and I know what it feels like to just be at the bottom of the barrel. I know what it feels like to hurt. And I, I don't want you to hurt if you don't have to. And so if there's a way that I can say something that Jesus can speak and transform you, and help you just get freedom from that. I want you to stop believing these lies because they shape the way you live. So this brings us to step three. This is the last thing in this series on, on, on how to be a winner, how to feel like you're winning in life. We're gonna believe a sacred truth. That means we're gonna stop believing the lies. And we're gonna believe the sacred, meaning this is what Jesus says, over you. And the way we're going to do that is, is I'm not going to tell you that you just need to ignore all these lies that come into your mind, but you also need to ignore them and then replace them. So we don't want to leave empty space there because if you leave empty space, it's just going to fill up with something else. And so what you're going to do is you're going to identify the toxic thoughts that you have. You're going to identify the bad patterns that you have. You're going to identify the areas where you don't believe in yourself. And then instead, you're going to replace those things with what Jesus says about you, or, or something good, something positive. See, so there's, the, the, there's three easy ways that you can do it. This is, this is like the, the church, this is a church answer. All right, so for all my old school Christians and all my, my new people that, that you've not given your life to Jesus, you, you're still kind of figuring this whole thing out right here, that this is the most churchy church answer that I could give you, and it's three things for, for how to identify and replace. You can memorize scripture, you can turn sacred truths into statements and you can say them every day. 
Now, I know that you're going to roll your eyes and you're going to say, that's such a Bible answer that's, ugh, come on, you know, give me something that's actually practical. But I'm telling you, even though this is a churchy church answer, this is the most practical thing that you can do for your life. And I can prove it to you because there's a whole bunch of people out there believe in words of affirmation. There's a whole bunch of people out there that believe in positive energy, that believe in, in, in speaking positive things. You know, you don't have to be a Christian or a Christ follower to believe that what you say over yourself and what you say over others matters. And so if I think about that and I'm like, wow, even if the world that doesn't belong to or believe Jesus believes that there's power in what you speak over yourself, then we have the most powerful God. We have the most powerful book. We've got, we've got, we've got the Bible. We've got this. If you take this and you start to remember parts of it, and then you start to speak those statements over yourself, and then you say them every day, then that's going to renew your mind. That's going to bring you change. But it takes consistency. It takes some time. So what I've done is I've got some examples for you. And we're going to put these on the screen. So this is, this is because of Jesus, th- these are some statements and some things you can memorize and you can speak over yourself. And I've got the verses here for you as well. So if you want to take a picture of it, then, then please do. Because this is, so, this is so easy, but it's so good for you. It's so important for you. You know, you can say to yourself every day, I'm loved. How, oh man. How many of us don't feel loved by anybody? You wake up every morning, I am a loved person. I declare it. And you read John 3.16. I am confident. You declare it. I'm a confident person. I'm not afraid. I'm not meek. I'm not, I'm not pushed to the side. I'm confident in who I am because I know what God made me to be. And you read that truth in 2 Peter over yourself. I am chosen. How amazing is it to wake up every day and say, I'm chosen. And it's Ephesians 1, 4. You read that over yourself. I am enough. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You read that over yourself. And guess what's going to happen? If you do this every morning, all those new brain cells that you get every single day, you're going to wash them in the truth of Jesus. And all those brain cells are going to start to build up. And you're going to get some momentum. And those new cells are going to fill in those little grooves in your mind. And before you know it, you're going to change the way you think. You're going to change the way you feel. You're going to change your identity and who you are. See, this is possible for you. For those that still don't believe, it's possible. Now, the last thing I want to talk about before we close out this service is is this word strongholds. Stronghold, a stronghold is it's like being held prisoner and captive. So the strongholds that we have in our lives are the reasons why we have a really hard time believing. When you tell yourself, I just can't believe. I want you to look for what the stronghold is in your life. And just like the word says, think about what in your life has a strong hold over you. What is it in your life that has a strong hold over you? That's preventing you from believing, from thinking, that's preventing you from changing your thoughts. You know, does it have something to do with, with, with the way you were raised and maybe an, an abuse that you went through, an abusive relationship? Does it have something to do with you being abusive? Does it have something to do with an addiction? Does it have something to do with, uh, with, with, with just being born and struggling with depression or anxiety? Or, or was it that you were given just a, a bad hand at life? But what is the stronghold? Somebody has said something to you that's planted seeds in your life that's created strongholds. You know, it's, it's so wild. It just takes one moment. It takes one moment. You could be seven years old and somebody, could, somebody on the playground could say something to make fun of you. And boom, Satan just grabs onto that for the rest of your life. There's this stronghold that's just brewing. So I want you to think about what's the thing in your life that's got a stronghold over you. And we're going to look at what Paul says about strongholds because guess what? We can also conquer and beat strongholds. See, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, this is a powerful verse for you. 
If you can't believe, if you struggle to believe, you struggle to believe because there's a stronghold in your life. There's a reason why you just can't believe that Jesus can change the way you think and that you can win at life by thinking positively, that you can get up in the morning and speak these verses over yourself and you can change who you are. That stronghold is preventing that. And Paul speaks to that. This is for you. Paul's telling this for you. The weapons that we fight are not the weapons, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. See, I would love for my battle to be with, with, with a sword or a gun or a paintball gun or something. I would love to just take depression and just, just light it up. But see, we, I don't fight a weapon with, I don't fight with weapons of the world. I fight with spiritual weapons. See, this is, it would be easy if we could just stab it with a sword. But what Paul is saying is it's not about that. The weapons we fight with are not of this world. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. See, that divine power that you have, that power comes from Jesus. So everyone in here, everyone listen to this. Every single person in here that doesn't believe, that can't believe, that has a hard time accepting, has a hard time understanding, I want you to know that God has given you divine power, which is the greatest weapon that you could ever wrap your head around. There's no sword in the stone that's better. There's no gun that's better. There's no anything that's better. There's no gimmick. There's no special sauce. You have divine anointed power from Jesus himself that you can demolish strongholds. So guess what? When you wake up tomorrow morning and you speak over your life, I am enough, and you read that verse and that thought pops into your mind and says, no, you're not, you're not enough. Then you say, with the divine power of Jesus, because he loves me, I demolish this stronghold. Whatever you can't believe for yourself, you can claim this divine power over it. And with it, you will demolish strongholds in your life. Paul goes on in the next verse in 2 Corinthians and he says, he says this, he says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Which basically is saying, we destroy everything with that divine power that's not truth from Jesus. Everything outside of God's truth in your life can be destroyed with, with Jesus' divine power. That divine power is his love for you. So Paul says, we destroy it all, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, we take it captive. I I, I like to think about that as like, listen, I I want you to aggressively take captive these thoughts. When 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 Casey and I moved to Cape Town, we we came down here to try and, you know, start a... uh, came down here to try and start a church on our own. We were really struggling for three years. We couldn't get one, we couldn't get one going. And now I'm so thankful that, that we couldn't start our own church because instead we got to be with you guys. And that's so great. But I remember running on the mountain and I remember running down from the blockhouse, and my mind was consumed with, you're not enough, you're not enough, you're not enough, it's not working, it's not working because you're a failure. And I remember yelling as I was running down the mountain, no, I will not believe this for my life. I refuse to believe this for my life. I'm going to get through today and then I'm going to conquer tomorrow as well. And day by day by day. Now I'm sure to anyone around, who's this crazy person's yelling, running down the mountain. But listen, I took this literally. I took the thought captive. I put it in jail. I put it before Jesus. And I said, Jesus, this thing is in jail and it's yours. I'm going to let you deal with it. And you make that thought obedient to Christ. So this thought of I'm not enough, I'm making obedient to Christ. Christ is changing, saying you're more than enough because I gave my life for you and I died for you. See, with this, we're breaking strongholds and we're rebuilding with truth. And so what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to to stop accepting that the lives that you believe I want you to stop accepting that the lives that you believe are in charge of your life, that they shape your life. Instead, I want you to start believing that the truths that Jesus spoke for you are the ones that will shape the life that you will live. 
Let's, let's change our mindset, church. Let's just completely change our mindset. See, we're going to build our lives on a firm foundation. We're going to begin spiritual disciplines in our lives. And we're going to believe sacred truths. So you guys have got an enormous amount of homework to do. I want you to go home and I want you to divinely conquer every negative thought that you have. Make it obedient to Christ. And then, even though you struggle to believe, every day, you're gonna renew your mind a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Before you know it, you're a whole new person. I don't know about you, but I wanna be a whole new person. And I can tell you, three, four, five years down the road of doing this, I, I am a whole new person. Let's bow our heads and pray.